Well, a big welcome to our Fadishan Day. And today we are for a treat. We've got Mike Beaumont with us. And we'll hear a bit more about who he is uh, in a minute or two. But we also got Mark uh, Oaks with us, our worship leader, also one of our trustees. Therefore, just before I hand over to Mark, then I want you to actually just think of one thing. We want to invite the Holy Spirit amongst us and to speak to us in whatever situation we may find ourselves in. Therefore, let's just pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to connect once more. And Lord, we pray for everybody around the virtual table as it is. And we invite you in whatever circumstances we may be facing, whatever crisis we are in, whatever experience we are in, we invite you, Father, today to actually speak into our situations. And Lord, we long to see a breakthrough, Father, in our life. But Lord, we think also of the world stage this pandemic that's still going in many quarters of the world. And we pray, Father, Lord, that you will protect people. And Lord, during that time, Father, as their hearts soften, we pray in Jesus' name that you will speak to them and that they will discover and find you. Two, we want to thank, Lord, of the situation in Europe with what's happening in Ukraine and Russia. Lord, we invite you into this situation. We pray for wisdom, for insight, Father. Lord, and we pray, Lord, that your will will be performed, Father. And Lord, that uh, peace will rule and reign. This we ask you in your glorious and precious name. Amen. Well, if you just join us, we welcome you. And I'm going to actually add over right to Mark Oaks, who is our worship leader and also one of our trustees. Thanks, Mark, for being with us today. darkness open my eyes let me see beauty that made this heart adore you hope of a life spent with you here I am to worship here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, you're all together worthy, you're all together wonderful to Yeah. 
to hear the testimony isn't it this morning but we we too have our testimony of what God has done in our life he's a great God and uh, this morning I just want us to sing and focus in on his amazing grace in our lives and our situations today that he's here for us let's sing this together amazing grace amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a our hearts and our lives as we seek and we serve you in Jesus name we pray thank you Lord I'm going to hand back now to David Lurie thanks Mark for that yes amazing grace if it wasn't for the grace of God 
where we would all be. Well, if you just join us, a big welcome to each and every one of you. And we pray that uh, God will actually speak to you very clearly. And uh, we want his presence, yeah, to be manifested amongst us, you know. It's great to have uh, Mike Beaumont with us. He's the one who's got to actually speak to us today. We've had Mike in and out of studio over the last uh, six months or so, or maybe two years now, isn't it? Two years, yeah. And it's great to have you in our foundation there today. Great to be with you. Now, I am told that you are semi-retired and <laughs> you are a teacher, a mentor, a broadcaster. You've been involved with church. I'm sure your wife must be smiling when you say, I am semi-retired. David, whenever I say that, yeah, she always um, smirks or gives me a dig in the ribs or whatever it might be. But, uh, you know, you can never really retire in God's work and God's kingdom, can you? No. So, yeah, I, I took retirement from full-time paid employment seven years ago now. But, uh, yeah, God has kept plenty on my screen to be involved with, both in churches that I've been part of and the church that I'm part of now, uh, in some writing that I've still been uh, had the privilege of keeping up with, and uh, a very fortuitous encounter just a few years back with a guy called David Taverner when we happened to share a room on a tour of Israel together and did the usual, what do you do, what do you do? And I ended up here at UCB and having the privilege of yeah, recording a whole number of series of podcasts mm. for you guys, which has been enormous fun and an enormous privilege as well. Thank you for that, and uh, we love your dedication for the Word of God. But, you know, outside of the Word of God and the church and speaking here and speaking there, how do you relax? Ah, well, I've, I've just taken up uh, a hobby. Um, my hobbies used to be things like reading and uh, photography. I, I really enjoyed that. But um, recently I've gone back to a hobby that I had in my childhood. And as I need to tell you that as I tell you this, there will be some people who listen to this and think, great, and the others who will be thinking, oh, no. But I've gone back to railway modelling because I used to have railways when I was a young boy. I've not uh, touched it for sort of 50 years. And uh, I recently came into a little bit more money because it's quite an expensive hobby. Uh, and, and I was sitting there thinking, I wonder what, I should be doing with this besides giving some of it away, of course. And this thought flashed through my mind, you could always get your railway modelling going again. So I've been doing that. So, wow. yeah, that's what I've been squeezing in, write a few chapters of the new book that I'm working on at the moment in the morning and then, you know, maybe get an hour or so at the end of the afternoon to, to turn to the model railway so i'll take some videos and send it when it's all that, that would be great yeah <laughs> thanks for that yeah <clears throat> here is a question for you um you love the bible mm. what does it take to actually get your level of an un understanding well um it, it needs a heart that wants to understand i would say that's the first and foremost thing you know very often people criticize the bible and pull it to bits and say what rubbish it is by picking out odd random verses from here and there and proving that it can't possibly be true. Um, so I think, first of all, you've got to have a heart to want to understand. You've got to have a heart that says, God, I believe this book is, is your book and you could say something to me through it. And, and I've often said, even to people who aren't Christians, maybe you can't say all that yet. But could you at least say, God, if you are there, could you speak to me? If you were there and this is your book, could you speak to me? And the number of people I've seen again and again mm -hmm. come to faith in Jesus through doing that. So I think you've got to have a heart. Mm -hmm. You've also got to have a measure of determination. Mm -hmm. um, because let's face it, there are some books that are harder to understand than others within the Bible's 66 books. But these days, we've got so many resources, mm -hmm. whether it's from something as simple as UCB's work for today, or whether it be through getting yourself a good study Bible, which is a great next step if you want to dig a bit deeper, commentaries on individual books. For me personally, what it took 
uh, was going to what's now London School of Theology and studying for three years. We don't all need to do that. Some of us do mm -hmm. to be able to tackle some of those questions so that we can then use our knowledge and skills to help others. Mm -hmm. Uh, but a heart and a desire are, are the two most important things. And if you've got those two, plus a little bit of help from some of those things mm. that I've just said, uh, and God's work can really come alive to us and we can see how exciting it is and still how relevant it is. This is the thing that always impacts me. Here's a book that was written between 2,000 to 3,000 years ago, depending which part you pick, uh, and it can still be as relevant for life in 2022 today. For, for many years you've been reading the Bible. For many years you've turned to every page of the Bible. <laughs> do you ever get sick of it? No, I don't think I do. Uh, because the thing about the Bible is, you know, it is so different to any other book. Mm. As Christians, we believe this is a book that was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now, by that, what we mean is not it dropped from heaven uh, or a divine postman delivered it one day and pushed it through your letterbox. We believe that through its 40 or so authors over those 66 books, God's Holy Spirit so moved in those writers that what they wrote was exactly what God wanted written. Hmm. And, and so what we've got here is not just a book, but we've got God's word mm -hmm. to us. And so once you start to grasp that, I mean, how, how can you get bored with it? Hey, you can come to bits that you think, crikey, this is tough going. Mm -hmm. Some of those lists and some of those bits in Leviticus. But, you know, once you've grasped that God wants to speak to it, I don't think you ever get tired of it. And here's the amazing thing for me, David. I think you'll probably be the same, you know. You can read the Bible and, and sometimes you get to a bit and think, have they put that bit in since yeah, I read it last true. time? You know, and they haven't, but it, it, it comes alive to you afresh or you see a different angle on it. You see something that you've not quite seen before. Yeah. And this is where the Holy Spirit takes it and keeps it fresh. And, and again, if we've got that heart and willingness God never ceases to stop speaking to us. And in all the years that I've been reading this since I first became a Christian at the age of 18, I just find it as exciting today as it was that first day that I picked it up. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Just before I let you loose to minister to us, here is another question, yeah? What advice would you give to the people who are with us in the round? this virtual table and they struggle, you know, they start and they stop and they start and they stop and somehow they can never, never be consistent in going through the world. What advice would you give them? Yeah, let's face it, I mean, that can be one of the hardest things, can't it? Mm. Is just sticking at it day after day after day after day. Um, and I'm sure, you know, even with us today, there must be people who've made New Year's resolutions to have a go and buy certainly long before Valentine's Day, we'll have, we'll have probably given up. I, I think you do need some sort of structure to help you, some sort of framework. There's all sorts available today to do that uh, and to be able to tick it off each day. But I think also getting into a routine or a rhythm. So for me, reading the Bible is the first thing I do uh, after breakfast. Now, I've done that for many years uh, as, a, as a pastor but I'm still doing that in retirement. For you, it might be on the bus going to work. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, it might be at night before you go to bed, but get in a rhythm and a routine. I think a little check-off list to be able to tick the box each day helps as well, though we don't want that to become like a curse mm -hmm. hanging over you that you miss today. But, but rhythm, routine helps. I think the other thing is accountability. You know, if you're really struggling with reading your Bible every day, then I would say, why don't you find someone else in your church or a fellow leader? Uh, because let's face it, leaders too can struggle with this. You know, it's not just new Christians. And just agree to keep yourselves accountable to one another and check in at the end of the week. So even right now, I've got one of the young men in the church that I'm part of, 
who's been struggling with getting into discipline and routine. So we check in. Uh, it was every Friday at seven o'clock. It's now moved to Sunday at five o'clock. You know, do whatever it takes mm. to check in with accountability. And I'm there not to poke him in the eye if he missed a day, mm. but to ask why it was. What, so why did you miss it? What happened there? Mm. What could we change to make that? So I think you need discipline. You need a routine. Mm -hmm. But sometimes accountability, chosen accountability, can be a great help at just thinking, oh, I really can't miss it today because David's going to be asking me on Friday whether I've read it or not this week. And I want to be able to say yes, not because I want to please you. I want to please my Father in heaven. And I want to please my Father in heaven, not by, just by having said I could tick this box. Mm. But I want to please him by getting his word into my heart mm. so that I can live it out. And as we're going to see in a moment in what I'm going to share, mm. there is great value, incredible value in systematic reading of God's word, as I've experienced time and time again. Mm -hmm. Well, great advice from Mark today. You know, for me, the Bible means a lot as well. I don't call it the Bible anymore. Do you know what I call it, Mike? I call it the divine manual, <laughs> because I know if I turn to a manual, I have to not only read it, but put it to practice to make sure that I can get the benefit of it. Mm. Well, I won't say any more now. I'm just going to hand over to Mark. Enjoy God's word today. Bless you. Thank you, David. So it's great to be with all of you um, today. And interestingly enough, uh, David doesn't know what I'm going to be speaking on today, but the sort of questions he's asked me do lead us in very well to what I want to share. Um, I want to start with a personal story because the last two or three years uh, of my Christian walk with Jesus have probably been the hardest of my 54 years of walking with him. I became a Christian at the age of 18, so do the math and you can work out uh, how old I reached recently. Uh, but these last two or three years have been some of the hardest of those 54 years, and it's not just because of COVID. Uh, back in June 2019, my wife Liz and I went on a fabulous sort of once in a lifetime holiday with a couple of friends on a fly drive tour uh, of uh, California. And we had an amazing time. So we did the cities and the coast and we did Yosemite uh, and we went up to Lake Tahoe. It was an amazing time. And we came back from three weeks just feeling, oh yes, this is so incredible, so relaxing. But we came back from that vacation to the news that my 33-year-old youngest daughter, Becky, who actually happens to live in Denver, Colorado in the USA, had developed breast cancer at just the age of 33. And I think you'll probably imagine, you know, the elation of this wonderful holiday uh, quickly dissipated. Well, we ended up going back uh, to the USA uh, at the end of August to support her uh, while she had her surgery, while she had a mastectomy. She has two young kids. We went back to help look after them while she was going through surgery. Um, we were only going to go for two weeks, but uh, the British Airways pilots kindly organized a strike and meant that we had to stay for an extra week. And the only reason we'd not stayed for an extra week was the fact that the flights were just too expensive to come back that week later. But all things worked together for good. Uh, and we were able to stay with her for three weeks while she had her mastectomy. Then we went back again uh, the very end of November and stayed for six weeks over Christmas while she had her reconstruction surgery and again to support the kids. And as we came back home, wow, you know, we all just breathed a sigh of relief that this incredibly challenging season of her life and our life was over. But then exactly one year later from when she was first diagnosed, back then in June 2020, Becky 
was diagnosed with having a second cancer in the same breast, in an area of the reconstituted tissue. Now, here was the amazing thing. It was not a recurrence of the first cancer. It wasn't that the first cancer had seeded and had reproduced itself again. It was a completely different, genetically different type of cancer. Now, this is incredibly rare, so rare that her consultant actually asked her if she could end up writing a paper out of her and having it produced in, in all the medical journals in the USA. So what did she have to do? She had to have further uh, surgery, much smaller this time. She also had to have fairly intense chemotherapy and radiotherapy to deal with this. But here was the big challenge for my wife and I. We couldn't go back and help her this time because we were now in lockdown and the USA had firmly closed its doors and we just could not go back in. I cannot tell you how helpless we felt. Then during this whole process, September 2020 now, my five-year-old American grandson, Gabe, developed um, a, a burst appendix and he had to be rushed into surgery. Now, OK, these sort of things happen, except over the next few weeks, he kept having to be rushed back again and again and again in excruciating pain because there was something clearly not right. Well, they managed to sort that out. But then two weeks later, my wife, Liz, was diagnosed herself with breast cancer through a routine uh, mammogram. Well, I think you'll probably see from that pileup of all those events that these were, yeah, as I said, two or three of the, the worst years of our life. Clearly, this was going to have to be a season for fighting in prayer. And particularly in that season when we couldn't do anything, when we couldn't get back to the USA. Now, I know myself. I fight best in prayer when I know that God has given me a scripture to stand on, when I can take hold of it and fight through that. And it was pretty early on during Becky's first cancer and first course of treatment that I was crying out to God for something to get my feet on because I, I felt like my feet were on, you know, when you're trying to climb up a hillside and there's, there's rock and shale there and you, you can't get a grip. And I felt like I couldn't get a grip and I was praying, but I could not get a grip. I could not get my feet on solid ground to pray out of for Becky. And in that season, David, you were just asking me about praying and reading God's word in a routine way. Well, I was working through at that time two kings. Now, let's face it, you know, some great part in Two Kings, but some parts of it can be, be pretty hard going, particularly where you get those wonking after another who's disobedient and come under the curse of God. Um, but I was working through the scriptures. And just that day, just the right passage happened to come up. I cannot tell you, friends, how many times that has happened over 54 years of reading this book, when just the right passage has come up on just the right date. That's one of the reasons that I recommend systematically reading through God's word, not sort of finding a crisis and opening the page and hoping a word will come up. But when you have been plodding through God's word systematically and just the right word comes up on just the right date, that's when you know that God has spoken. Well, that day I happened to come up uh, into 2 Kings chapter 19. It's Isaiah's prophecy over King Sennacherib of Assyria when he attacked Jerusalem in 701 BC. Now, just to set a bit of context, in 722 BC, 
Assyria had attacked the northern nation of Israel and had wiped it out, had exiled all its citizens across the Assyrian Empire and had imported other conquered peoples back into the north, which would become that mixed race eventually known as Samaria. But in 701 BC, Sennacherib turned his attention to the south, to Judah, wanting to take that. And he'd invaded, he'd attacked and conquered many of Judah's fortified cities, including the particularly strongly fortified uh, fortress of Lachish. And then he turned his eyes east to Jerusalem, sent his army to surround Jerusalem and it sent this uh, message to them through his field commander saying, can you not just look, look at all the nations that I've conquered. Has any of their gods ever been able to protect them? Why do you think your God would be able to protect you in the face of what you are confronting right now? Surrounded, there's no hope for you. Come on, surrender now to me and I'll treat you fairly. And then just at that point, there'd been a temporary relief because Egypt had marched out against him and he'd had to withdraw his forces to go and deal with them. And everyone in Jerusalem had thought, whew, thank goodness that's over. But of course, then he come back to attack once again. And a bit like COVID, you know, the onslaught had been pretty relentless. And this time, King Sennacherib sends a letter to King Hezekiah, a threatening letter to him. And this is one of my favorite parts that's here in Two Kings, also recorded in the prophet Isaiah himself. And what, what the king does, as many of you will know, is he takes this threatening letter and he spreads it out in the temple before God. And he says, God, would you look at this? Would you look at what? They are saying they want to do with me, with your people, with this temple of yours. And he spreads it out before God. And as he cries out to God, God sends Isaiah, the prophet, with this message. I want to read to you from 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 19 to 28, which is Isaiah's prophecy. And I'm going to read one other passage in a moment as well. But 2 Kings 19 and verse 19 to 28 says this. So this is the end of Hezekiah's prayer. Now, Lord our God, deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. Then Isaiah, son of Amos, sent a message to Hezekiah. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I have heard your prayer concerning Sennacherib, king of Assyria. And this is what the Lord has spoken against him. Virgin daughter Zion despises you and mocks you. Daughter Jerusalem tosses her head as you flee. Who is it that you have ridiculed and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes in pride? Against the Holy One of Israel. By your messengers, you have ridiculed the Lord. And you've said, with my many chariots, I've ascended the heights of the mountains, the utmost heights of Lebanon. I've cut down its tallest cedars, the choicest of its junipers, I've reached its remotest parts, the finest of its forests. I've dug wells in foreign lands and drunk the water there. With the soles of my feet, I've dried up all the streams of Egypt. Have you not heard? Long ago, I ordained it. In days of old, I planned it. Now I've brought it to pass that you have turned fortified cities into piles of stones. 
Their people drained of power are dismayed and put to shame. They're like plants in the field, like tender green shoots, like grass sprouting up on the roof, scorched before it grows up. But I know where you are. And when you come and go, because you rage against me and because your violence has reached my ears, I will put a hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth and I will make you return by the way that you came. And suddenly, those last words leapt out of the Bible to me. I'm sure many of you have had this experience when it's like a Bible verse has come on fire and something's resonated in your heart. Like the two on the road to Emmaus said, did not our hearts burn within us? And at that point, I knew that those final verses were the words that God had given me. I've been crying out to him, give me a rock to stand on to pray from God. And it was that verse, verse 28, I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth and I'll make you return by the way that you came. And at that moment, I knew that God had given me that verse to pray over Becky's cancer. This cancer had come against my daughter and it surrounded her and trapped her like Sennacherib had done with Jerusalem and it threatened to take her life away like Sennacherib had. That was the verse that God gave me to stand as a rock on. And every time I prayed for my daughter, several times a day, I would stand on this rock and I'd sort of almost look across to America and I'd imagine my daughter there and the cancer in her body. And I would say, cancer, God says over you, I will put a hook in your nose and a bit in your mouth and I will lead you back by the way that you came. And I prayed that again and again and again and my wife prayed that with me. And I shared that verse with some of my close friends who prayed that with me, the senior pastor that I work with now in my seminary time, it prayed that daily with me. And we prayed it and prayed it and prayed it until that cancer had gone. Now, actually, when the second cancer came, I have to confess, I felt deeply discouraged because I felt, God, you said to me, you put a ring in its nose and a bit in its mouth and, and lead it away from where it had come. But then God took me back to this story in its context because, of course, Sennacherib had attacked, had to withdraw to go to Egypt and deal with them, and then it come back with yet another onslaught, exactly as happened with my daughter. And I thought, oh yeah, this verse is still good. This verse still has power. And so I continued to pray this verse again and again and again and again, standing on that rock until she got the all clear. Do you know, just yesterday, my son-in-law sent a video of my daughter snowboarding down the mountains in Colorado. She's not been able to do it for five years first because she had a second child and was recovering from that. And then this whole cancer saga. And it was such a delight to see her zooming down this mountain on her snowboard yesterday. And my thinking, oh yes, God, <laughs> you indeed put a ring in its nose and a bit in its mouth, just like they used to do with an oxen, of course. And you led this cancer back by the way that it came. And I felt today, I wanted to encourage you to, to take hold of scripture and to fight from scripture. And I want to share a, a second passage with you that, that for me gave me, and again, it's just from some readings fairly recently that I've been doing, that I think gives some grounding uh, to this because uh, here in a sense is something of a, an explanation of the principle behind this taking hold of scripture and, and praying it into being. And again, it comes from something that I'd been reading recently. And I, I want to read a second passage from Numbers 21 
verses uh, 10 to 18. Uh, and, and then I'll comment on it. Uh, this is from Israel's journey through the wilderness. It's towards the end of that journey. And I'll just read these few verses and then comment on them for you. Numbers 21, verse 10. The Israelites moved on and camped at Oboth. Then they set out from Oboth and camped in Iyer Abarim, in the wilderness that faces Moab towards the sunrise. And from there they moved on and camped in the Zered Valley. They set out from there and camped alongside the Arnon, which is in the wilderness extending into the Amorite territory. The Arnon is the border of Moab between Moab and the Amorites. That's why the book of the wars of the Lord says, Zahab in Suaf, Sufa and the ravines, the Arnon and the slopes of the ravines that lead to the settlement of Ar and lie beyond the border of Moab. And from there they continued on to Beer, the well where the Lord had said to Moses, gather the people together and I'll give them water. And I have to confess, frankly, I thought, oh, I'm in one of these passages where it's just long names, hard to pronounce. I don't know what I'm going to get out of this bit today. But hey, hang on a moment. From there they continued on where the Lord said to Moses, gather the people together and I will give them water. Then Israel sang this song. Spring up, O well, sing about it, about the well that the princes dug, about the nobles of the people sank, the nobles with their scepters and their staffs. Now, as you know, one of the things that characterized God's people in their journey from Egypt to the promised land was grumbling. Isn't it a good job we don't get grumbling in the church today or any Christian organizations that we work with? Mm. Well, yeah, grumbling was, was pretty common with them, wasn't it? Uh, and grumbling normally for two things. What were they? Yeah, food and water. And they're still grumbling about those two things as much at the end of their journey as they were at the beginning. Uh, just the previous chapter, we get a time setting for this story because in the previous chapter, in Numbers 20, Aaron has died. And we discover later in the book that he died in the 40th year. Okay, how long were they in the wilderness? 40 years. So now, right at the end of their journey, as it's almost at an end, they're still doing what they were at the beginning, still not trusting, still grumbling, still saying, where are we going to get water? Where are we going to get food. But I love this little story because God anticipated their cry and got there before them. Verse 16, we read that God said to Moses, gather the people together and I will give them water. Okay, there's the promise. God got him first before they'd even asked, gather the people together and I will give them water. There's the promise. But the promise didn't just happen. Israel had to sing into that promise. Look again at verse 17. Then Israel sang this song. Spring up, O well. Sing about it. Then Israel sang this song. Now, I, I confess I'd read this passage many times before, and I suppose, you know, sometimes you read it, but you read it thinking what it says is what you've always thought it said. And I suppose what I'd always thought it said is that God says, gather the people together and I'll give them water. And afterwards, the people then sang this song. Yay, sing this song to the well because God provided water there. Let's make a song about it. Hey, let's record it. And we could have it broadcast on UCB. But it's not what it says. It doesn't say God made this promise. And afterwards, they sang this song. God made this promise. And then 
they sang this song. And what I suddenly saw there was that there are times when God gives us a promise, but then we have to sing into it. We have to speak into it. We have to speak faith into it. We have to bring it alive into that situation, just like I had done over my daughter. God had given me that word from 2 Kings 19, but it didn't just happen because I saw it and it leapt alive. I had to pray into it, speak into it, sing over it. You know, sometimes that singing over it doesn't mean that simply we sit back and wait and pray. In fact, if you look at the very lyrics of this song, it looks as if the singing over it and speaking into it also involved the fact that they had to get their shovels out and start digging. So on this occasion, they had to do something. In just the previous chapter, by the way, they'd had to do nothing. God had miraculously brought water from the rock. This time, it looks like they had to do a bit of digging as well as singing over and singing into it. And I know this is a bit of a sort of prophetic type, pastoral type application of this scripture. But I felt it just helped me so much in what I wanted to share with you today out of the first story I gave you, which arose out of testimony. And then out of this, again, regular routine reading. That God wants us to be people who expect to find promises in his word that will come alive in our hearts. But those promises aren't magic. He wants us then to speak into that promise, to sing over it in the words of this until the water springs out of the well, just like healing had sprung up for my daughter, Becky. So what I wanted to end up with today was, was this. What promise is there in your own life today that you know God's given to you and perhaps either you've just got a bit weary with or you've forgotten or you've set to one side. And today God would say to you, I want you to start singing over that promise again. I want you to start speaking it out in faith again. Don't let go of it. Sing to the well. Sing over the promise for UCB here. David, what promises has God given you that you and your team need to keep singing over, singing over, speaking out again and again and again until you see it come to pass? For those joining us online today, what promise has God given you personally for you, for your own life, for your family, for your church, for your ministry? And God wants you to take hold of it boldly once again today. Maybe you have been doing that, but it's not happened yet. Well, God wants to say, keep singing, keep singing to the well, keep singing to the well, because if you do, the time will come when the well will give up its water. What promise has God given you in the past that maybe you've just forgotten, got weary over, maybe neglected, and today, even now, as I'm speaking, God's reminding you of that promise. And he wants to say to you, sing to the well again. I really pray that today, for all of us, it will be a day of us singing some songs again. Singing, speaking out the lyrics of the promises that God has made and is singing, 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 speaking, speaking, speaking into it until we see the water breaking forth, until we see the cancer utterly removed, until we see that which God has promised coming to pass, even if, no, especially if, it looks completely impossible at the moment. God bless you all as you seek to put that into practice. Wow, Mike, 
beautiful words and a reminder when we have a time of devotion, the importance to make sure that we somehow synergize the Word of God with our prayer. And as we've heard today, let's sing those promises. Let's stand upon those promises. God's still the same today as he was yesterday. He hasn't changed. Amen. But you know what? He's able to change any situation that you may find yourself in. We've heard today from Mark his own testimony of breakthrough. Can I just say to you, God hasn't forgotten you but he's right on your case and he wants to somehow revive those promises that he has gave you. And just as we've been advised, let's shout them, let's pray in them and let's expect what God is going to do through them. Mark's going to lead us into a time of worship. That's a time between you and God. He knows your situation, every single detail of it. He knows your anxiety. He knows your fears in those situations. Hamill says to you, he wants to bring peace right now as he brings back to you the promises. Do you know a promise, as far as God is concerned, it's a fulfilled prophecy. Yeah. It's a done deal. What you have to do is to take it for yourself. Yeah. And as you speak those promises right during our time of worship, watch what God is able to do. Amen. Thanks, Ma. My hope is built on nothing less blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus name sing that again my hope my hope is built on nothing less Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ our Lord, cornerstone.
Powerful word. When darkness seems to hide his face, let's think what we've just been told because his grace is unchanging. Mark, can you lead us into that one again? And I want you to sing it like you never sang it before, even in your own home, even in your own car, wherever you are, God sees you and God wants to give you your breakthrough. Therefore, as Mark, uh, sing it again. Let's believe those words, that God's grace is unchanging. Thank you, God, that you are still God. 
Thank you, God, that you are steadfast. Thank you, God, that you are faithful. You've seen every situation led before us today. We thank you, God, for speaking to individuals and touch seeing them at their point of need. Thank you, God, for being God. Amen. Well, we're coming to the end of our hour again. You know, when you are in the presence of God, time just flow. And I want to remind you that next month on the 24th of March, Suzanne Atting will be with us. Therefore, be ready because God wants to speak to you. And not only that, but invite somebody. Make sure that you pass on to them, you know, the notification of that date and that we can actually crowd the virtual table for people to hear a message of hope. And also I want to continue to promote what Mike Beaumont is doing on UCB2. And uh, I believe that this very week on the 26th of February at 9 p.m., it will be the launch of your new podcast, which is Bible Surprises. In 30 minutes, what's that all about, Mark? Well, it's a surprise, so I, I can't tell you. It's actually not launching this week. It launched at the start of the year, but that's this week's episode. Goes out nine on the 9 p.m. slot uh, on UCB2 on Sunday evenings, but then, of course, available as podcasts, either on the UCB player or people's usual podcast provider. But yeah, it's a surprise. I just can't tell you, sorry. Okay, it's a surprise. You can't tell us, therefore, let's get together at 9 p.m. on a 26 and find out what the surprise is going to be all about. For now, we're going to move for those who want to into rooms. And the purpose of that is to have fellowship, is to reflect together. Do you know when we were together in the room, we did that over lunch, did we? And we got to know one another. And what we find over the years, as people were making acquaintance, they started to need some kind of friendship. And we discovered that ministry started to work with one another. And that's what kingdom is all about. And therefore, we're not together physically in one place, but we are together in virtual. And with technology today, everything is possible. For thanks for being with us. May God bless you, be with you, and we look forward to see you next month on the 24th of March. God bless you, enjoy your time of fellowship. But if you have to go, go with God's blessing. See you soon. <laughs>